Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Elise Patterson. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really glad you could do this. Thanks for having me. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, here, let's see if I can add the captioning. Perfect. So Elise Patterson, in her own words, um, she's the founder, executive, and artistic director of Abilities Dance, which is a Boston-based dance company that welcomes artists with and with disabilities. Uh, she was an artist in residence with the city of Boston's transportation department, using dance as a way to promote more accessibility in the streets and sidewalks of the city in 2022 and 23. And she also served as the executive director of Ballet Rocks from 2020 to 2022 which is a Boston-based dance education program providing access to high-quality dance education to youth within the Boston public school system and the AFSTER school program in Jamaica Plain. Outside of the self-produced abilities dance shows, her choreography is prepared in the MFA Lynx Hall in Chicago, Gibney Dance in New York City, and the series volume four at the Ailey City Group Theater in New York City, and many more. She's given lectures and workshops at schools, universities, and organizations all across the country, including Harvard Graduate School of Education, Fidelity Investments, Boston University, and more. And she earned her Bachelor of Arts in Biological Sciences from Wellesley College and Master of Science in Management Studies from BU Westrom School of Business. And as a student, you sailed from Massachusetts to Ireland and conducted research in the Atlantic and Caribbean oceans on coastal runoff sponge species and spider habitats. And as I understand, you're also a proud spider mama. What's your spider name? Her name is Petunia. Aw, that's awesome. And she's a passionate uh, researcher and science communicator dedicating to uplifting Black women in STEM. Thanks so much. Uh, do you want to tell us more about Abilities Dance, your company? Mm -hmm. So um, Abilities Dance was founded in 2017 and really trying to promote intersectional disability rights in dance, but it's become definitely multimedia in music and visual art and all of these different elements that kind of go into our work to tell these stories that are not often told in dance or just in general. Um, and yeah. that we kind of bring awareness and to um, uplift and to um, highlight that we are here and able to create compelling pieces of work and to um, employ folks who are able to do that work and to um, also um, within that performing company program or outside of it rather and the community engagement work go a little bit deeper and have even deeper conversations about some of the lessons we show on stage or just have movement classes that folks can access for free um, with different partner sites um, so that dance can also be uh, accessible in a dance education way, so. That's yeah. really awesome. And this is how you and I met, because you had reached out for um, a costume for your walker, mm -hmm. essentially, which was really neat. So that's the first thing that we did together. And it was based on the designs for Black Panther. So I did the Wakanda walker for you back and forth. And we've done several shows together, mm -hmm. which has been really, really neat. Um, what are some of the things you like most about, you just put up a show, I should say. So congratulations, um, Intersections of Version 3? Yes. Great. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it went and what that whole Intersections thing is all about? Yeah. The, um, it's now become kind of an annual spring show where the premise of it is to really highlight BIPOC and disabled honorees past and present and kind of amplify their life arcs on stage. And in addition to that, um, where applicable um, connect bills that are on the Massachusetts state floor that are affecting the deaf and disabled community and kind of uh, weave in some of that narrative um, to really bring the personal out in the bills um, that can really feel so um, kind of dense and foreign to those who might not be um, uh, this their experience day to day. And so to provide more understanding so that folks really understand the meaning and can connect with their legislators to get some of these bills uh, pushed and passed. Um, so yeah, it's a, a beautiful series. <laughs> it really is. 
Um, how did you start putting this together? I mean, I think it's brilliant, first off. But. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think uh, talking with myself and Andrew Cho, who's our director of music, and um, how it was um, feeling the, the isolation of um, not as much ex access work and racial equity work, and then vice versa, not as much racial equity work and access work, and um, trying to, as bo both of us live in the middle, um, finding a space where um, we can feel really seen fully, and so wanting to create a space that um, not just um, amplifies the energy and the work that we both have and identifying both, but also to uplift others and to show that we have been here from our past honorees or ancestral honorees rather, um, and are still here for our living honorees and to um, really be able to, yeah, have a, a disability history class in a way um, to share with others the important work that folks are doing um, across different industries and different um, fields and different time periods and all of that. And for people who might not know, the notion about intersectional is about how our different identities intersect. So all of the things, all of the things that we are as human, but some, what are some of the topics that you're touching on this time around? Yeah, um, in our most recent show, um, we have had um, an honoree where we discussed the impact of climate change and um, into disability and how that also um, has impact um, immigration because a person was leaving from the impacts of climate change and globalization and all of that. And so um, how that also ties into another honoree um, who is a Palestinian poet and um, the impacts of um, what's happening there and um, the connections to disability justice and just all of these other intersecting ideals that we are, had been highlighting throughout the show and also throughout these different honorees' lives and how they're all kind of uh, united in a way. So, yeah. Yeah, because I love that one of the things that we did with the first ones that you and I worked on was, you know, everything back from some of the real racism of the suffragette movement, some of all kinds of different um, aspects of different types of disability. I just love that we're, you can touch on all the things that are human and really make them more relatable in some ways and just through movement. What drew you to dance first, by the way? I've been dancing off and on since childhood, so it's always been a part of my life and even informally just in community spaces. And so um, dance and movement has always been there. Um, and so when deciding what to do um, next um, beyond the sciences, um, adult movement was a, a really strong calling to come back into and to not just kind of be in it, but see how the different lessons I've learned and the different impacts that I want to have can also be a part of this as well. And so it's definitely evolved for yeah. sure. <laughs> Do you feel like that you've been incorporating more of the sciences into the realms of your dance? Mm -hmm. I would say definitely more research. Um, mm, the, makes sense. <laughs> the impact of research on not just um, an honoree's life in this case, um, but also the um, elements around that honoree's life as far as like different um, political movements or different wars or different um, just kind of different cultural moments that are happening in, in this honoree's time. Um, all, all of that has been really important to really try to see more fully an honorees um, live work as opposed to just the kind of direct um, what I might read or what I might get in a conversation. Um, and even beyond that in our other shows too, just researching different things like you mentioned of just how um, neurodiversity can um, be a part of the space where it not, often not is um, in disability spaces um, seen so boldly and so so loudly or um, the racism and suffragette movement and reading about that and um, having conversations about that. Uh, all of that requires a, a, diff, a 
particular level of research um, that you can then jump off of and then infuse the artistry and the creativity. But without having that, you have to, to have that home base of knowledge and, and growth to really have something impactful and meaningful and true. Yeah, of course. And it really does make a difference. I can tell that all, so much of the work is founded on that research. Thank you. And do you have some particular favorites for some of the honorees? that you've been working with? Mm. Or is that is that like asking you to pick favorite spiders? Yeah, it's like asking a favorite spider, you know? I, I'm um, sorry, that's not fair. <laughs> I mean, I think they're definitely um, favorite elements of the process. Mm -hmm. um, like when dancers get to connect with living honorees and have conversations, um, which usually almost get to with um, our living honorees. Um, to be able to have the dancers working on the piece connect later on in the process and share these are the elements that we're highlighting on and can you expand a little bit more or just connect human to human and ask, oh, I'm thinking of writing or I'm thinking of doing this. Um, what are your tips? And to be able to have those conversations so that they realize too that they're, um, they are these really great, amazing folks, but they're also just humans and getting to connect on that level is, is important. Um, or just getting to be able to see the different pieces at play and how they all kind of fuel into the, the larger mission as far as like writing the audio descriptions and how that has narrative and story or um, seeing how the music will start to kind of integrate more and more into the piece and we build alongside the movement and seeing all those kind of come together and, and play is definitely also a favorite. Yeah, that's wonderful. What is it is so do you start with the research? Do you start then by contacting the honorees if they're still around and with us? Yeah. And then do you interview them? Do you do group interviews with the dancers? How does this work? Yeah, it usually starts with either um, research if ancestral or um, an interview with me one on one um, to just have a conversation and talk about different um, different questions but really make it be open so that the honoree can talk about their life arc in whatever way they so choose or focus on whatever way they so choose or to share things with me in private um, that might be helpful to note when looking at it but maybe not necessarily be for public or part of the piece um, mm -hmm. and so all those elements are are important and helpful. And then from there, then you go into the the virtual or in-person studio and start the rehearsal process or the creation process and have that go on for some months. And then about midway through, then the dancers get to meet the honorees and talk about where we're at and um, what's been happening and kind of have an update um, so that they also feel that they can get some um, creative control and how their life arc is being portrayed and if it's correct or to correct if it's not, um, and then keep on keeping on and then show. <laughs> yeah, and then you have a show. Yeah. I know it's what a neat thing to try to translate somebody's life into movement. And do you find that sometimes it's more narrative do you, or sometimes it's more emotional? Yeah, I think it, it depends just, on the honoree and depends on yeah. how, um, what pieces of themselves they try to to share or also just to the um uh ancestral ones in general tend to be a bit more um narrative and more kind mm -hmm. of um minister say chronologically but a bit more of a of a flow as opposed to with the living honorary that you can have a conversation with and say Oh, share a little bit more about how you're feeling in this moment or um, some deeper elements that you might not be able to glean from online um, or in books or where whatever their medium might be. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's yeah. different, different areas, different ways. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a process. Yeah. You'd also just recently done, or not that long ago, did the band ballet, which is mm -hmm. about band books. Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit how that came about? Because yeah. book banning is being a problem everywhere right now. It is tragically still. Yes. Um, yeah, it was, um, I think the prominence of book banning was starting to come up as we were 
thinking of our next theme for that ballet um, and seeing uh, more and more, even though the time Florida was um, in particular, still is, um, very uh, strong in uh, banning books that we had not seen before as far as like Ruby Bridges story or um, uh, different different books that we would deem not controversial at all but they are starting to and so all of all of those conversations and especially as someone like myself who likes to read a lot and the game about the impact of of that for kids and not being able to have that um was uh distressing and so wanting to create work about um how could it be if a librarian who is feeling that frustration falls into this magical book world and kind of goes through her own journey um and so that's that's where the it started um and that's then neat. Kind of wow <laughs> um what particular books because I didn't get to see this one so I'd love to know a little bit more how it went it was good it was definitely a lot more um multimedia than we had in the past as far as we created our own little children's book which was really great that's so cool. Um, the the premise of the show, and then it was illustrated by um two disabled teen illustrators, which was great. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so being able to have that was really nice. Um, and then also having um a little bit of animation in the beginning, um, was also important. Uh, to be able to um kind of really highlight that this person is entering a a magical world and like the the world we were just in um and having also very um bookish kind of set design to really help set the stage um and yeah it was definitely a um pulling on a lot of different mediums that I hadn't worked in before as far as um figuring out illustration and figuring out um uh graphic animation and all of those those things to to be um push ourselves creatively and also to tell important stories so okay. wonderful really exciting and, and a lot did you i'm hoping you had really good help yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, i mean you know also always an ongoing journey um and yes of course <laughs> more and more dollars get more and more folks but yeah it was it was great um, and definitely always nice when dancers support other dancers um, in uh, figuring out remembering choreo or helping put on a costume or helping to um, just kind of be in space with one another and support with whatever access need might arise. Um, so that's always really helpful too to see kind of community coming together and supporting community. Well, it seems to happen so much with your dancers. I'm sure that you are choosing people based on that anyway, too, whether they work well in community. Yeah, I mean, there, there definitely has to be some kind of underlying emphasis of what that can look like. And for um, everyone's not going to be the same thing um, as far as like helping to, I don't know, put on a dress or something, but if it's maybe that's not um, something that they're comfortable with or in their wheelhouse, but maybe it's that I can help in the front of house with doing other things. And all of that is kind of important to, to figure out um, how this person can work well to support one another. And because, um, yeah, we all are trying to be interdependent um, as much as possible, um, trying to put myself in there most of the time, but <laughs> overall, um, a lot of independence, which is great. No, that's really nice. And because uh, some of the, your dancers, I'm sure, need more, have more access needs than others. But just anytime you're putting together something like that, you, people are going to need help, period. Mm -hmm. There's just so much to do. Yeah. Did so you smart. have a graphic designer? Um, for the animation, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, Will Machado. Um, they're a, an animator locally here, um, and it, they're great to work with. Um, and also That's awesome. There's also a big queer trans emphasis on this show as well. Um, so it was great to also have a lot of queer voices too in the mix to, to really highlight um, a conversation that is affecting us all. So 
Yeah, especially in light of so much of, of what's being banned, that's so super important. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a, this is something we were just talking about also a little bit before, uh, the, the problems of finding funding, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is, which is just real talk on the um, finding things like grants is tricky for anybody. How, what are the best sources that you have for funding and how could people help you? I think honestly, newsletters are great um, to be able to know um, what is coming through and definitely it, joining different like local e-listservs and um, just really folks trying to share info with one another. Um, where someone might pass me or I might pass a person, oh, this might be a grant you're interested in and just trying to, to share there. And those have been definitely my best uh, sources. Yeah. Um, and then it just supporting us um, coming through to our shows. Um, it's also helpful too. And even though we have free tickets, um, the numbers help to show funders that this is impactful to the community and here are the numbers to back it up. And so um, that's also helpful um, and then donating, but if not in a place to donate, they're still sharing, going, coming to shows and sharing the word of our work and um, being able to just highlight also the mission of the work of like sharing these bills with other folks and all of that, all of that uh, works together to help us, so. Excellent, help, help keep you dancing. Exactly. Along with sometimes giving yourself a chance to rest, you got it. You are getting a little bit of a chance to rest. You took a little break just recently. Yeah. How was that? That's nice. I went to Mississippi, um, and that's where I'm from. Uh, so, got to see some family. Um, got to catch up on some sleep, and <laughs> now just kind of coming back and resting for a bit before jumping back into it. Yeah. So important because yes, that's that's a lot of work to do because you are, well, for a while you were doing all the work for Abilities Dance and for Ballet Rocks, which was a lot. Yeah, yeah. So being able to break away and then just kind of focus on this um, was really important to, to also really help expand and grow um, because also writing all the grants takes time and can only do so. <laughs> When you're also doing all these other things so having uh, more space um even though not all the space because there's still other elements of the work to focus on as far as like creating the shows and promoting the shows yeah. and that, but still more of a focus and that has made um, a world of difference that is great what would you like to see for it going forward like how, how would you like to see ability to dance grow yeah i think i i mean definitely more full-time staff um, mm -hmm. so important. Um, having other folks also be able to just kind of <laughs> send <their> it off. <laughs> yeah, main focus, um, which we're working on that too. Um, and I think just continuing to have more folks, whether it be virtual or in person, be able to show up for the work and keep attending and keep sharing with their loved ones and just seeing the audiences grow more and more year over year. That will be awesome. I think that's so well worth it. Uh, how can people find all of your work online? I mean, are, are some of them recorded? Some of them are live only. Some of them are recorded and you can live stream. How do you work it? Yeah. So um, as far as when performances themselves happen, they're usually kind of live and live stream. So that folks can kind of, um, after I've just get a, a link. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we typically open those links up to the broader um, public at least a couple weeks after. Um, so the most recent intersection show isn't out yet, but it will be soon. Um, but everything else is up, including the band ballet um, on our YouTube page. Um, awesome. If you look for Billy Dance Boston on YouTube and go to our channel, then you can see the different shows there. Yes. And terrific work. Uh, one of the things that I've really loved about working with you, I mean, there's so many different reasons, by the way, no. but I love how you incorporate the descriptions of the movement along with the pieces, which is super rare in dance. You just do not experience that often. Um, what, first off, I know that's a huge process. How do you do this? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I it definitely started um, with just kind of basic movement description. Um, and then I realized that was really boring. <laughs> and, <laughs> Left and, leg up, green, yeah. <laughs> cross to side. Yeah, and it yeah. wasn't getting the the emotion and the energy that was happening on stage. Um, and especially with everyone hearing it, I wanted it to be um, a kind of sensory space where um, even if you um, were able to see this, I like you could still get more um, from hearing these descriptions and let it be more of a universal experience as yeah. I just kind of actively tuning it out. Um, and so having narrative really helped. And then especially in cases like intersections, um, being able to um, directly tie in more sentences and more um, yeah, more of the their journey and their um, conversations and their emotions as they're sharing it um, has been really helpful to also um, really highlight the, the movement as well. No, it works so beautifully. And one of the times that I saw it so clearly is when we were working on Firebird. And it was so your version of the Firebird, which was an incredible adaptation that you and your musical director worked up. It's beautiful. But also having the descriptions to go along with it, it becomes a poetry, mm -hmm. which is really quite beautiful. Yeah, it's its own kind of writing style, for sure. Um, and definitely can take a moment and take some pause oh, yeah. and remembering, oh, this section of the dance is meant to be this. So let me pull it out a little bit more with this phrasing or the balance. Um, I'm lucky to be able to work with um, Amber Piercy, who's our descriptions editor, and who mm. makes sure that the balance of kind of movement and narrative makes sense. Um, and um, since I don't identify as blind, having someone who does to really be able to understand what um, what is needed in different points, um, or just really clarify, um, especially if new to dance, um, what yeah. these specific moments mean. So, yeah, that's been really helpful. Yeah. So for people who are not familiar with it, um, these descriptions help people who are either blind or low vision to actually enjoy what's happening at the mm -hmm. same time. But that's so cool. What kind of experience have you been getting from blind participants, from people who've been uh, coming out after the dance with the descriptions? How are they feeling about that generally? Yeah, um, usually pretty positive responses. Um, I mean, even at our last show, um, someone who was in person mentioned that um, dance is usually very abstract. Um, yes. And so um, <laughs> basic movement descriptions, um, especially if not in dance, can be really hard to understand, even if it is there. Um, and that hasn't had normally been their case either. So having descriptions that shared more of the storyline um, made sense and it was really exciting and engaging to listen to them so yeah exciting feedback for sure yeah it just makes it much so much more of a story because I'm sure just explaining it's like this is their foot position is totally not going to mean anything to you especially yeah. if you're not familiar with dance exactly did you train in both ballet and Modern, what what did you train in with Dan? More ballet. Um, modern came a bit later, but um, was there. And then definitely as I, in my later adult years, was figuring out what movement styles were, just took more modern then. Um, but I would say ballet is definitely more home-based and kind of where a lot of the movement comes from. Hmm. Oh. So it sounds like that your experiences with other dance companies had not been so great, which is a big part of why you developed your own. Yeah, yeah, which is very unfortunate, but it's... Oh, <laughs> unfortunate, but sadly common. Yeah. I mean, especially if you've got any form of disability, dance is not kind. It's not. And yeah. it's tough um, because I think also being in more... Um, as we've grown and working with more folks um, outside of um, whom I've known or um, access needs that I'm more familiar with than others, um, having to share with folks about um, 
maybe not being in a position to be able to offer exactly what is needed at this exact moment, um, but something that we can work for later, um, or that um, certain folks beyond myself that um, might be working with might not be as familiar with that particular disability. And so maybe that choreographer isn't as best of a fit. Um, those lesson or your conversations rather also lessons but um yeah. have been <laughs> happening a bit more and so it's definitely given pause but I think there's definitely a difference in the conversations as opposed to a no and this isn't dance versus a we don't have what you need at this moment but let's stay in conversation until we can get there so that's also well, just such a much more open honest and human interchange yeah just to have awesome. i know what yeah. type what types of access needs are you wanting to try to incorporate next um i would say um definitely more um folks who are able to support more like kind of um shadow dancers who are able to work with more cognitive disabled dancers and kind of learn mm. the choreo alongside them and be able to reflect as needed um, as opposed to um, either just one or um, others having to kind of fill in as needed. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that dedicated person that the person can rely on. Um, being able to um, and thinking of more choreographers beyond just me, um, just <laughs> yes, you know, <laughs> thinking of having having a little more time needs, yeah, yeah, having more experience, um, and beyond, um, like I've developed a lot and learned a lot in my in my journey, um, and some of that was just kind of through the experience of working and trying and failing, and not everyone has been there. So having others to also be able to just have the experience of working with a number of different um, type of disabilities and um, being able to provide the best experience for everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Super important, especially with all the community engagement stuff that you do as well. Yeah. Like, oh, no. Uh, are there some different organizations that you're working with more now with some of the community dance? Yeah, we um have partnered with um an elder uh, central Boston elder services where oh, neat. we're in several um either residential or um more elder community centers and being able to provide weekly movement classes on location in those spaces um so that folks are able to move and they're all like kind of multicultural and multilingual and um, have different disabilities or not, um, but they um, really show up for the teachers and that's an exciting part of the week, an exciting part of the teacher's week, um, and just a, a great space to do movement. That's really cool. So you're working with uh, uh, teachers on site? Um, yes. Okay. Not, sorry, I personally am not. The teachers okay. <laughs> that are not me. <laughs> are working on location, um, except for one who has to be remote, but um, the other teachers um, are go into the community mm -hmm. center room or um, whatever the designated space is and provide um, different weekly classes. Yes, because you personally can only be in one so many places at once. Exactly, yeah. Because <laughs> that is a lot. You have been very, very busy, yeah. it seems like. Um, <laughs> What things do you have coming up on the horizon? Yeah, um, I look forward to being in a more supervisory role um, for this <laughs> next one. Um, so we have there a, you go. a virtual dance early show um, where they all um, oh, neat. A piece um, with kind of climate justice and disability justice focused. And um, since it's uh, climate justice, it's completely virtual. Um, so dancers will be using the end and whatnot um, just to kind of reduce our footprint um, in the, the making of the piece. That would um, be neat. Um, yeah, excited to, to see what work is created and how they interact with different folks and yeah, how it all works out. How will you guys be doing that? Or is that something it's, you'll find out in process? Um, and different choreographers will have their own process, but um, as far as on my end, it's more of just kind of making sure that 
the themes are in alignment with what they want to explore and that um, folks are making it weekly to the different rehearsals and I'll be kind of like watching back from afar but still having my check-ins with the choreographers mainly um, as opposed to the dancers to make sure um, they have what they need and um, problem solved from there. That's great and also yes a little bit more of a rest for you. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> Um, you know, supervising has its own kind of needs and unexpected things, um, whether it be choreographer or dancer or whomever might be a part of it. Um, that's its own, its own ordeal, but for now. <laughs> for now, but also yeah. maybe a good way to find the choreographers that you'd like to help eventually work and flush out what you've got. Exactly, exactly. So nice. All the good stuff. That's a great way to do it. Yeah. I mean, um, but climate justice is a perfect one. Mm -hmm. And that will be, I, of course, this is the time. It's the time we need to be talking about it. Are there any other projects that you are having in mind? Um, we have our annual fall show, but um, themes of that is to be determined, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not trying to rush you <laughs> yeah you gotta look out on our website for more info <laughs> yeah there's yeah. always something you want to put up exactly and what were some of the bills that you were covering um for this latest concert yeah um there are definitely a lot um one was um a thinking of a, a group of trusted, um, kind of like an advisory board mm -hmm. uh, of loved ones as opposed to like um, mandatory um, guardianship or adult mm -hmm. foster care. And so um, thinking about kind of maintaining independence with a number of folks that you support in important uh, life decisions as opposed to a guardianship that could be prohibitive in different ways. So that's one. Um, another is an estate recovery bill, um, where here, um, if folks are on mass health um, and, um, and die, uh, they can uh, legally kind of try to reclaim some of the costs that they got while um, that mass health received while that person was on mass health during their life. And so um, mm. it's we're lucky enough to obtain real estate here that can um, be uh, getting their homes. And so that creates big barriers, especially for folks that are coming from like low income communities of color or other disabled families. And so trying to um, keep homes in the community and try to build generational wealth that way and kind of keep the cost recouping to a minimum and inform folks because also folks going on mass health might not even know that that can happen. Um, mm -hmm. so a lot to um, highlight and just kind of keeping homes moving through the family as opposed to um, yeah, what have you. So yeah, a lot of really impactful and important work. Um, and um, also on our, our website under our Intersections V3 event page that folks can check out uh, and learn more about that. Excellent. So do you generally put a list of all of the bills for each thing that you're covering? Perfect. So people can go and inspect and say, hmm. And yeah. even if you are not in the area, there'll probably be things you might want to think about for your area. Yeah. You know, Some of these things are kind of, um, even more um, federally, like there is a federal mandate of um, recouping costs. Math Health just says a little bit more aggressively. Um, so some of these things can be affecting multiple states um, and either folks aren't aware or um, mm -hmm. are also um, having their own fight on their, in their respective communities. So, yeah. No, and super important. So no, this is a great thing that people would not necessarily think about. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And how neat that you can bring this up with dance. What a cool way to do it. <laughs> Try to, yeah. Yeah, well, of course. Why not? Exactly. Nice evening of entertainment and introspection. Yeah. So. All yeah. of the things. Mm -hmm. Oh. How was your spider? 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I was just lovely. thinking of Petunia. Yeah, she's lovely. She's bougie and uh, a lovely lady. So I appreciate her. That's what type of what type of spider is she? Yeah, um, she's a Mexican red haired um, tarantula. So nice. Mm -hmm. Do you have a terrarium for her? How does it work? Yeah, cute little terrarium. Um, and open it up so that she has space to climb and explore and do all the things. And sometimes she might be on my desk while I'm working, but generally has her terrarium time. And yeah. Mm -hmm. I love Does she like she likes to hang out with you sometimes? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just hang out on my desk. Okay. Um, 20 million things. Yeah. Well, of course. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, that's really fun. I make, I just love this. Like it's Petunia, my spider. Exactly, exactly. So it's nice to have her out sometimes. And yeah, overall, it's just a time. So now she's <laughs> kind of um, coming back from a little bit of a rest. And yeah. To... Did you have somebody come and, and spider sit her? How do, how do you do that with your taping time off? Yeah, um, I was only gone a few days, so I didn't really need to. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's also the beauty of having a, a spider. She does not necessarily needed to have someone come check in on her every day or um, however often folks are dog sitting or cat sitting or whatnot. So Yes. Yes. It's not a daily need, not a high maintenance animal. <laughs> yeah. So having having that was great. <laughs> that's a really good. And that, yeah, and then you don't have to worry about it mm -hmm. either. The spider sitter. Exactly. <laughs> that sounds like a book, right? Yeah, it does. I I would read that book, but <laughs> <laughs> what are we yeah. doing? Uh, sitting with spiders. It's a good mm -hmm. day. Exactly. Also, possibly a fun dance. Right? It should be. Should do a large spider dance one day. <laughs> Have you, do you spend much time besides the research? Do you spend much time um, doing things with science and the work that you had done in school now? Yeah. Um, these days it's more kind of science communication work, which is okay. really kind of picking different science skills and teaching those to um, K through 12, or in my case, more so the younger age of the elementary even preschool sometimes. Age. Oh, fun. Um, and so I have a, a series with Discovery Museum of Black Women in STEM, and it is um, kind of highlighting different um, Black women in STEM past and present. And, oh, how fun. Um, connecting their, their work to different activities that kids can kind of explore and do and learn different skills, like how to use a pipette or how to use a protractor or, um, learning about weights and all of those different fun things that um, kids are definitely getting ahead in school. And so it was, it's always really fun. Um, definitely a, a chaotic time of oh, you know, yes. children <laughs> running around excited to do <laughs> things and do the things, but that also makes it fun because it's very interactive and very meant to be hands-on and um, not just kind of sitting in a desk and, but moving moving around and moving different different items for different activities and just yeah a very engaged kind of learning that I think should be more and more um in schools yeah because of course that's going to be so memorable for them mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask if you could ever bring Petunia to those but yeah I did um <gasps> one that was ecology focused which was really fun oh that's um, so cool generally um it depends on the topic or yeah. like chemistry or um, uh, astronomy or so many different um, topics that um, we as like women have been in. So that's been nice to also highlight to you that wow. we've encompassed so many different areas and made so many different contributions or continue to make contributions. So it's good stuff. Yeah. I also possibly a really fabulous dance series. Right. <laughs> that could be so cool. Right. Exploring all the different ways um, that we've been in those spaces. And yeah. 
Yeah. I like um, uh, both a combination of elders and current day that mm -hmm. <laughs> you can draw upon would be what a neat thing to do. Mm -hmm. I don't um, know. No, could be a bad. Could be really fun. I don't know. Maybe the <laughs> maybe don't don't need to throw extra work your way. <laughs> it's not like you don't have enough on your plate. Additional jobs, yeah, no, yeah, but they're always fun to dream about the the future shows and what those could look like and oh. yeah, shape all that good stuff. Yeah, that could just be such a cool thing to do, and mm -hmm. also, you know, possibly to share with all the kids. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like people to tell to know about? They should go and see your stuff on YouTube. They should go and follow Abilities Dance. Where else should they find you? Um, they can follow find us on Facebook and Instagram at Abilities Dance Boston. Um, and I think just yeah, keeping an eye out for when the next shows are or um, when we might be doing other events or other class workshop series um because we're definitely across all of us spreading out and doing a lot um in greater boston and beyond so um checking us out yeah, yeah. well especially with the virtual stuff because you've got i know former dancers who've gone out to san francisco and are living in mm -hmm. new york and several other places right yeah yeah it's always nice to see where folks end up and where they go and keeping the, the movement and spell flowing in these different spots. So, yeah. Yeah, it's all good. We'll just, we'll keep working on it. Maybe, maybe bring it in international. We'll see how that goes. One day. You okay. know, that could happen. It could happen. They can. They can. <laughs> you steps to get there, but I could see it. <laughs> I can see it happening. I don't know. There's, there are fringe festivals all over Europe. Exactly. Always an option. I know. Is where would be a place you'd love to go? Uh, I don't really have a specific place. I'm always open to um, wherever. Just mm -hmm. good, good folks to connect with. I think is the the biggest one. Um, so kind of making those connections and seeing how to integrate more than just kind of visiting, but really seeing a community and um, yeah, from that. yeah, yeah. I love that. All right, let's find let's find more of them. We can do it. Thanks I think that'll that. be great. I mean, we did it from across the country. People can do it from across the world. Why not? Exactly. As all possible. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Is it, yeah. Is there anything I don't know, anything else we should cover? No. I think things. Yeah. I think we're good. Okay. It's, and it's also really always nice to catch up with you. Because we both have dumb, busy lives sometimes, but it is All really good. Happen. Yeah, there yeah, we go. We'll we'll find ways to work together again. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> Thank Bye. you so much, and have a lovely uh, rest of your evening. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.